Еще раз добрый день, друзья. Я думаю, все собрались, и мы начинаем. Я хотел бы вам представить Дэниела, разработчика фреймворка Starlink, а также одного из владельцев студии Game.io. Вот Он вам расскажет о том, как эволюционировал его фреймворк, какие новые достижения в нем есть, как с помощью его эффективно и продуктивно разрабатывать мобильные игры. Поприветствуем Дэниела. Здравствуйте. And thanks for joining me today. This little presentation I will uh, make about mobile game development with the Starlink framework. Uh, it's the first time I'm here uh, in Moscow and the first time on a death camp, so it's really exciting for me to, to be here and be able to, to uh, talk to so many Starlink developers and Flash developers and HTML5 and all that's now done right here. So, I'll start with a quick introduction uh, about myself. Uh, my name is Daniel Sperl. I'm coming from Austria. Uh, I've done... Uh, in Austria there is a, a university I've visited uh, where I studied media technology and design. This was far back in 1999. And then a few years later uh, I worked at a company called Funworld in Austria, which created uh, coin-operated game terminals which were at that time uh, quite uh, popular in Austria and Germany. And there were lots of uh, small casual games that only took about five minutes per, per, per player. So uh, it was really fun to develop those games because the games were quick and, and simple to develop. That it was always just one developer and one designer on each game. So it was a quick way to iterate on games and to, to, to learn what's, what's important about game design and what's important about for a game engine. So, with this background, uh, I co-founded the company Gamua uh, in 2009 with my colleague Holger. And uh, since then we've done a couple of things in game development. We have created several uh, iOS games and apps, and of course the frameworks Sparrow and Starling. Our latest project is Flux. Uh, Flux is a backend for game developers and it's uh, targeted specifically at action script developers. There is another talk a little later today, uh, so be sure to, to uh, get an intro to Flux too. So, today I'd like to talk uh, about a few different things. Uh, first of all, Starling 1.5 is uh, coming out next week, so I'd like to show you some of the new features. Uh, and the main part of this talk will be about the difficulties of uh, developing for a mobile device. Uh, there are three points that are always coming up when you create something for, for a mobile device, like performance and screen resolutions, all the different res resolutions you've got to, to handle, uh, and memory considerations. Uh, the, the memory part will be the biggest one of this presentation because uh, I've got uh, feedback from several developers who have problems with that and I thought it would, this would be uh, a great opportunity to show you some tips and tricks on how to deal with it. And at the end I'd like to give you a quick outlook about the future of Starling, what's going on with it and uh, yeah, what are the, the next plans we have with it. First of all, uh, who in this room has used Starling before? Okay, great, that's quite a lot. So I will make this introduction really, really short. So if you haven't used it, it's a pure action script library uh, for Adobe Flash and Air. And its main feature is that it recreates the display list architecture, the classic display object, display object container. Here or here you have uh, on the GPU with stage 3D. And uh, through Stage 3D, it allows you to be used very efficiently and create very fast games that deploy to all different platforms. So from the browser to the mobile phone, you can, uh, you can deploy it anywhere. So here are a few games uh, that have been built with Starling. There are literally hundreds out there. Uh, of course, we're always very proud to, 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 uh, that Rovio has used Starling for its Facebook version of Angry Birds. Uh, but what I'm really personally even more proud is that there are so many indie developers like you 
uh, he used it for really amazing stuff. Like, I don't know if you see the credit beat in action, which really looks amazing. And uh, Nuptos uh, on the top left is a uh, multiplayer online role playing game in the browser, which was built with Starling, uh, actually from guys in the Czech Republic. And yeah, we have Snail Boy and, and yeah, really, really amazing games. So, starting 1.5. It's currently available as a release candidate, so those of you who were following Starling a little bit in the forum where I'm, uh, where I'm ac actively uh, describing all I'm doing, uh, you will find a link to the release candidate, but if you wait a few days, uh, as soon as I'm home from, uh, from the dev camp, uh, this will be the, the stable version. And it includes many uh, internal uh, improvements, so lots of things that you that are not visible on the surface, but that just make it uh, more efficient and that uh, just make it work on different mobile devices, especially on Android. There are some workarounds uh, so that it works out of the box on some on some devices, which would be otherwise problematic. So an update is definitely highly recommended for anyone who is using it right now. So here are some of the features. Uh, which we've added in this version. There's an automatic profile selection, and I'll come to, uh, back to that later in a minute. Then the context uh, loss handling was uh, enhanced, so this is something uh, that I meant before when I said it just works out of the box on more devices, and context loss handling is one of those things that always are problematic, uh, especially on Android. Uh, startup time was reduced, so Effectively, there's no startup time. And uh, some little things like you can now finally rotate the atlas, atlas textures, so you can use uh, more efficient atlases. There's a system user class for cross-platform development and lots of other things, so you uh, definitely need to check it out. Uh, when, I, when I will release it next week, uh, I will make a huge uh, blog entry with all the features so you can, can start it quickly and and know your way around the new uh, methods. So, uh, to the main part of this uh, presentation, development for mobile. On mobile, of course, the performance is limited. You have got a slower uh, CPU and a slower GPU than you're used to. Uh, desktop, uh, they are quickly uh, getting faster every year, but still, you have to be careful. Uh, a very big problem is that you've got to uh, support a plethora of different resolutions. You have from, from the uh, iPhone 3GS up to the uh, iPad Retina. Uh, you, you want to create a game that works on all those devices and uh, probably with one code base, so it's a hard thing to do. And Starling has a few things to help you with that. that to help you with that. And limited memory, this is uh, one thing that's uh, probably the hardest uh, to cope with on mobile, but more that later. Okay, For, as I said, the main, thing, the main uh, topic of this talk will be memory. Uh, for performance optimization, uh, definitely check out this link. Uh, it's in the Starlink Wiki, it's a very long article about all kinds of tips and tricks uh, that help you to get the most out of Starling, how you have to set up your display list, uh, how, how to use texture atlases, and some action script uh, hints that make your uh, game just run a little faster than before. So this is probably the first thing as a Starling developer to get it quick, uh, to, to get the game perform fast, look at this page. Then screen resolutions. Uh, another area where there's a great introduction in the Starling wiki. Uh, in Starling, we've got a scale factor on each texture. Uh, any of you who have done some iOS development will, will know how, this, how, how that works. Uh, and there's, uh, this is a huge help in creating, especially on iOS, uh, for multiple resolutions, but also on Android. So definitely have a look at, at the, uh, that article in the wiki. So, this is where I will get a little bit more into detail. Uh, memory on mobile. So what's the problem on mobile with memory? Mobile devices have, of course, a limited amount of uh, memory. And 
they have huge resolutions, or some of them have really huge resolutions. And what makes this especially bad is that uh, 2D, 2D games need lots of textures. So this doesn't fit together. It makes it very difficult to uh, use these limited resources to uh, cope with all those big graphics. So first quick tip, do not embed textures. We've been used to this in Flash for long years, but on mobile, don't do it. Embedded textures are in memory two times. First for the class, and then the actual texture. So this is a sample code. I'm sure, I'm sure you have seen this before. Uh, first you embed uh, the PNG file, and then you make a texture from the PNG file so, you, so that you can use it in styling. Now, the, the bad thing about this is that the texture is in uh, memory twice. First, you've got the hero class, who captures all the data about the PNG from the PNG, and then you duplicate it in graphics memory because you've now got this texture object and it will be uploaded uh, to the GPU. So it's effectively in memory two times. So don't do this. Instead, use the asset manager that comes with Starling. So the asset manager has a few advantages. First of all, it takes care of context losses. Uh, if you don't know what that means, it's uh, on several mobile platforms. Uh, there's this really annoying thing that, for example, you rotate the device and suddenly, boom, all textures are lost and you have to recreate them. There's nothing that Stali can do, can do against it, but it can at least cope with it and restore those textures quickly and easily for you. And this is done by the Asset Manager. And this somehow plays together. It's optimized for minim minimal memory footprint, so it can restore those textures without keeping them in memory. And uh, the nice thing is that it's very easy to use. So, for example, here, this is obviously for an AI application. Uh, you create an asset manager, and then you add all the files of, of the texture folder we've got here in one step to the asset manager. Then you load the queue. This means the textures will be loaded one after the other. And that's it. Then you can just access uh, through this, this class. You can access any textures. So this is something that's new and starting 1.5. Uh, there are rectangle textures. So rectangle textures are actually not uh, something you will, you will see inside Starling. It's not a class you use directly, but it's a stage 3D class that Starling uses internally now. Because the old class, the standard textures, they always allocate mipmaps, whether you need them or not. So even if you if you said, okay, I don't need mipmaps, I don't uh, allocate memory for them, it doesn't work, the standard textures will always allocate mipmaps. Rectangle textures do not. So, to activate this, uh, you have to use uh, one of the more modern profiles of, of stage 3D, so you have to start starting either, either in baseline or baseline extended profile, uh, and as soon as that's done, uh, Starling will automatically use rectangle textures behind the scene and boom, you've got uh, one third of memory saved. So very, very easy to do and uh, saves a lot of memory. And the, the easiest thing to activate this is to start Starling in this way. It's, uh, you note the new parameter at the end. Normally you pass the, contact, uh, the profile you'd like to use to Starling and here there is this new auto string that you can pass there. And this means it will automatically use the best available profile. So if rectangle textures are available, they will be used. It uh, doesn't get any easier, easier than that. So ATF textures. Uh, for those who haven't heard of those, this uh, is a special texture format that uh, stores the textures compressed on the GPU. So if you have got a, a JPEG texture or a PNG texture, it's of course also compressed, but only in conventional memory. As soon as you upload it to the GPU, it will be deflated and, and will take up lots of memory. Not so with ATF textures. ATF textures are compressed, uh, are stored compressed on the GPU and are rendered directly from this compressed buffer. 
So this is what it looks like. The downside is it doesn't work for all games because the image quality is reduced by quite a bit. We see this when we zoom a little in here, uh, or at least uh, you could see it if, if the uh, colors are a little bit brighter, but there are artifacts like, uh, like, your, like, like in a low uh, quality JPEG file. So there are some tricks to cope with it. For example, you can uh, create the, use actually a bigger texture, a uh, taller texture, and then scale it down so the artifacts become uh, less apparent. And so you can somehow work around these limitations, but it's not possible for all games. Just keep it in mind and experiment with it. Uh, it's very easy to play around with them because uh, the Adobe ATF tools uh, are just command line uh, tools that you can uh, convert any texture into this format and then add it to the asset manager, just like a normal texture, then you can try out how it works for you. This is also a classic tip, uh, bitmap fonts uh, always reduce the memory you need because the nice thing about bitmap fonts is you've got this one texture with all the characters in there, this is in memory once. And no matter how many text fields you create, how, many, how, how long the texts you have or, or how, how often you change them, it will always be just this object that is in memory and it will just pick the characters from this big object and draw it on the scene. And this not only saves memory, but it, it's much easier and faster to render. So, especially if you change text, normal true type fonts always have a little bit of a lag, and then pause the game a little bit when the texture is uploaded. And with uh, true type, uh, with bitmap fonts, this just goes instantly. Nice thing, uh, the asset manager uh, knows how to work with bitmap fonts. So you see here in the fonts. Uh, folder, we put a bunch of bitmap textures, uh, bitmap fonts, so two files, the texture and uh, the font file. And uh, when you call load queue, the asset manager finds out that these are uh, fonts and will register them and let them use right away. So it's really just the one line of code and uh, you are using bitmap textures, ah, bitmap fonts. Then all of you, I'm sure, know how to use Texture Atlas, and that is really an important thing to use, and this is what the basic thing that makes Starling perform fast. And there are some things you can do to, to make your Texture Atlas more efficient. For example, Starling allows it that you trim transparent borders away, so uh, tools like Texture Packer will find out that a, a texture has a transparent border, and then it will just trim it down, and Starling will then uh, uh, blow it up again. And this is new for Starling 1.5, you can also activate rotation. So the, uh, like the guys on the bottom, uh, textures can be rotated and this makes it uh, easier for the texture packer tools to uh, efficiently pack all those textures in one file. So don't do this on your own, there are great tools for this. The last tip about performance, uh, about memory and performance, obviously, use Adobe Scout. Adobe Scout comes for free, and since I think uh, one or two versions back, they added support for uh, texture memory display. So uh, you see directly in which frame you've got allocated which, uh, how much memory, how much texture memory. You can do this in Flash directly. Flash only shows you the conventional memory. So you, with Adobe Scout, you finally get to know uh, what's happening behind the scenes and where is all those memory going. So it shows really every single object allocation. I've used this. Uh, I'm using this all the time for Starling as well. So even uh, if, I'm, if I'm adding a new feature for Starling, it's always checked with Scout to see if everything's working, working great. So again, this is free, a free download from Adobe. Uh, definitely worth trying. To summarize, use the asset manager, then start starting in profile auto probably. This is the, easy, that is the easiest way to use the new uh, rectangle textures. Try ATF textures, always use bitmap fonts, 
optimize your texture atlases and use Adobe Sculpt. So those are really the points you need to keep in mind to keep your memory footprint as low as possible. So let's uh, look a li little bit into the future of Starling. Uh, I've heard from several developers here and elsewhere that uh, since Adobe obviously cut down resources for Adobe Air a little bit, uh, if this also affects Starling, so it does not. Uh, Starling is still supported by Adobe, so Adobe is sponsoring us in the development, and uh, it looks as if this would go on really for a long while. And what's really nice is now that the team inside Adobe that works on AR is smaller, it's actually easier for me to talk to them and to, uh, to collaborate with them and, and, and tell them what the priorities of the Starling users are. So this has really worked out well in the last year. There were lots of changes that were directly uh, uh, affected by, by feedback and talk uh, that we did with the Adobe team. And for the Starling features internally, uh, the, the community behind Starling uh, is always the, the most important factor. So there's a huge community. Many people are in the Starling forum every day and answer questions and help out, so it always amazes me. And I'm always listening to that. And uh, it's really that way the, next, the features of the next Starling version are not what I have in mind, but what what's, uh, comes up most often in the community and what the community thinks is most important. So this is what I'm trying to do. So it does look a little bit now that uh, <laughs> this conference has changed its name and uh, <laughs> lots of other things, but at least, I think, at least for mobile development, uh, Flash is still a really powerful way to, to create mobile content and uh, especially if you uh, I just w was in a, uh, a session about HTML5 development, and you see, yeah, they're, they're, they're making progress, but it's still, some steps are really hard still right now, even though there's so much progress. Flash, on the other hand, works right now, it works well, and uh, for mobile development, I don't think there is anything right now that matches what you can do with AIR and the simplicity uh, of AIR to get this content out. So, just hang on. <laughs> okay, that was it. Thank you. Daniel, you see the platinum sponsor of this ceremony is Unicorn. <laughs> Flash <Oops>. not <laughs> Adobe uh, was uh, released uh, next version of uh, Air and Flash, and, and uh, there are some new uh, features like uh, Agile 2 and uh, multiple render touches. Do you plan to, uh, in, uh, to use these features in next starting versions? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, that's right. I think it was last week that a uh, new version of Air and Flash Player were released, and they did. Uh, and some very interesting new features for, for stage 3D mostly. Uh, for example, you can now uh, render to, to two or more different render targets. Most of those features are uh, more targeted at uh, 3D engines, but there are some features which really uh, would make uh, sense to add to Starling as well. Uh, for example, those render targets uh, is something that could be used for great special effects. So uh, I'm definitely looking into this, and we'll see where, where it makes sense to, to make use of those features. Okay. Uh, Daniel, what's your nearby plans for maybe 1.6, 1.7, maybe in plans? Uh -huh. Can you tell us something about these so, versions? As I said, it's always I, I have some ideas for those versions. For example, uh, what, I, what I'd like to do for a long time is that you've got um, uh, pixel perfect uh, collision detection. So when you when you or hit testing, so when you click on the texture, that it knows if this is a transparent part or, or if there are uh, pixels there. Uh, another thing I'm 
trying to, to, to finally uh, work, uh, look into is 3D transformation, so at least a little bit like, like it was introduced uh, in the latest, in the Flash 9 or something, where you've got those uh, pseudo 3D uh, translations. Uh, so this is what I'd like to do. But it always depends on, 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 on the community. So okay. I've always, I think what's important is I always think it's better to make what's there work flawlessly than, than to add feature after feature and, and everything is just 50% working. So this is my priority. Okay. Uh, one of uh, starting branch on GitHub uh, have uh, optimization of vertex data. It uh, use byte array instead of vector. Yeah. Is uh, uh, one dot five have uh, this optimization? No, it does not. Uh, I'm still working for for a change from Adobe for this. So they promised that they would do this. So uh, for the others, uh, currently uh, I'm rendering the the objects, uh, or I, I'm uploading the data in a certain way to the GPU, and I could use byte arrays, which would be more performant. Uh, but it would also use more memory in the way it's implemented right now in Flash. Uh, but now that you say it, there was, I think last week there was somebody in forum who had a, had a workaround for that, uh, which I will look into. So if this workaround will make me use this feature, or if Adobe finally fixes this for me, whatever is, is through faster, uh, then uh, this is something that will be added to, to Starling. Great. Hello. Hi. Could you please publicly uh, assure us that you will think about event dispatcher? Sorry? Event dispatcher. Event dispatcher. <laughs> <laughs> I have a proposition to you. Ask yeah. how many developers are here, and then uh, how, how many of them actually likes it. And then <laughs> yeah, I don't like it either. <laughs> Just for a reminder for version yeah. two. Yeah, OK, thank you. <laughs> About bitmap fonts and Japan translation, please. Uh, you mean the problems of bitmap fonts with translation? Japan. Uh, Very complex language. Sorry? Very complex. Japanese. Ah, Japanese, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a problem. Uh, bitmap fonts, uh, the usage of bitmap fonts is limited uh, when you've got languages that have uh, a huge load of different glyphs. So for Japanese, it's just, it's not an option. I mean, if you just, if it, it, it would be possible if the amount of text in you, that you have in your game is limited, uh, because then you could just uh, analyze the text you're adding to your game and then create a bitmap font that uh, creates exactly the glyphs that you need. Uh, but if that's not, that doesn't work, then you can either uh, fall back to true type fonts or you can kind of pre-bake your texts. So you, you write a special tool that renders your texts and puts, put them in the final form into an atlas and then loads that as a texture. It's a lot of work, but there's no way around that. There's no really good solution for, for uh, more complex languages like that. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you.